And uh, now we turn to uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 3, starting in verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Please pray with me. Father, we, we listen with keen ears to hear the truth of this passage, what it is to be a child of the living God. So we pray now for Pastor Trent as he preaches, Father, with, with great boldness and clarity that you would speak to him and that by your spirit and the truth of your word, you would cause this reality to, to seep down deep into our souls, that it would affect every dimension of our being and of our lives for the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, once there was a young boy who had a little dog. It wasn't the cutest little dog in the world, but it was the young boy's dog, and so he loved it. And one day he took the little dog outside into the yard, and they were playing and having a grand time together when suddenly the little dog made a beeline for the gate, and he ran right out of the yard. And the little boy went after the dog, but the dog was faster than he, and the dog kept on running, and he went around a corner and around another corner and another corner until ultimately the little dog was out of sight. The little boy was devastated that he'd lost his dog. Several months went by, and the little boy was walking down the street, and he looked into a shop window, and there he saw his little dog for sale. So he goes into the store and he says to the shopkeeper, this is my little dog. And the shopkeeper says, sorry, son, this might have been your little dog, but he's my dog now. And if you want him, you're going to have to pay me for him just like everybody else does. The little boy was distressed and distraught because he didn't have money to buy his little dog, but he went home determined. And over the next weeks and months, he began to work delivering papers, mowing lawns, babysitting children, until finally he had earned enough money to purchase back his little dog. And with that money in hand, he walked back into the store, he gave the money to the shopkeeper, he purchased the dog, he grabbed the little dog and held it tight, and as he walked home down the street, he said to the little dog, I owned you. You ran away from me, but I pursued you and I bought you, and now you're mine, all mine, and I'm not letting you go. It's a little bit like what God has done for us. It's a little bit of what Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross, has accomplished for us in bringing us into this kind of a relationship with God. We're talking about the theological doctrine of adoption. And it's precisely where the Apostle Paul points the people in Galatia in our text today. You see, 
These were people who knew intellectually, we might say they knew objectively, that they were the children of God. But subjectively, at the level of their experience, it made absolutely no difference whatsoever in how they lived any given day. And so what happened was, when some false teachers came into Galatia and said, if you'd like to be God's children, or if you'd like to at least be God's good children, then you need to add to faith the works of the law, because that's what good children do. And the Galatians, being so unaware of the experience of being God's children, fall for this. And they begin to live as though they now need to do something to add to what Christ has done to make themselves worthy to be called the children of God. And so what does Paul do? He takes them back to the truth of their adoption, which is entirely based on the work of Christ and is made a reality in their life through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now... There are many of you out there this morning who have been walking with Christ for a number of years. You know intellectually what we've just sung many times this morning. I am a child of God. But as soon as you stop saying those words, that's where it stops for you. And so actually in your day-to-day -day existence at the level where you live and work and play and interact with other people and so on, the fact that you're a child of God makes absolutely zero difference whatsoever. You're just like everybody else, a slave to fear, living like an orphan, not like someone who has been purchased and who is beloved and who belongs to God. And here's how it works itself out in your life. There's all sorts of ways, but you're worried and fretful about tomorrow because you don't believe in your heart of hearts that you have a loving Father who's all-powerful, who's working on your behalf to make all things come together for good. Here's where it works itself out in your experience. You're a person who's just like everybody else out in the world who's identifying your value based on your position and your possessions. And so you're looking for more and more because that's where your value comes from. That's your sense of identity. Or maybe you're a person who's always complaining and bitter and negative, always finding ways to measure yourself up against others so you can feel a little bit better about yourself. You know where all these things come from? They come from not knowing that you are a child of God. And so we're going to jump into this text this morning where the Apostle Paul points us back to a very important theological truth. And I'm going to sum it up for you under three headings this morning. The first thing we're going to see is that our sonship is in Christ. Our sonship is in Christ. The second thing that we'll see is that our sonship is part of God's gracious plan. And thirdly, we will see that our sonship is the fundamental truth of our identity. So let's start at the beginning. First, our sonship is in Christ. If you look with me in verses 25 and 26, we see three truths that show us how our sonship is in Christ. So the first thing we see is that we're all sons. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you're all sons of God through faith. So he's connecting here with what we saw last week. Christ has come. God's people were under a guardian, that is referring to the law, for many, many years. They were a church under age, essentially. But with the coming of Christ, he has borne the curse of the law in himself, removing it from us. He's fulfilled the law on our behalf, making us righteous. And now we're in the position of sons who are mature and do our Father's will, not because we have to, but because we want to, because our position has changed. And then he goes on and says this in verse 25, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Now, Paul's writing to a mixed group of people. He's writing to a church like you, and in this church are men and women, and it's a mixed group. And yet, Paul says, you're all sons of God through faith. Now, what is this? Is Paul being typical male chauvinist? Is he, is, he, is he being the sexist that many people accuse Paul of being throughout the Scripture? Is that what's going on here? And the answer is no. That's not why he says you're all sons of God through faith. What he's doing here is actually very intentional, and it would have been considered exceptionally radical in his day to call 
all of you sons. Why would that have been radical? Well, in that culture, as in many cultures still today, a daughter was a second-class citizen. A daughter had less value than a son, and a daughter didn't get to share in the inheritance in the same way that sons do. That's how families worked. But Paul says, not so in God's family. That's not true in God's family. There's no second-class citizens. You're all sons. You all share the privileged position. You're all blessed to be the beloved who shares not partially, but fully in the inheritance that Christ has earned for you. Amen? Amen. You are a son in the fullest sense of all of that meant in Paul's day and today. That's a beautiful truth for us to embrace. We're all sons. Secondly, he says, we're all in Christ. Look. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What does this mean to be baptized into Christ? You may know that baptism is a sign and seal of the new covenant. And baptism represents to us, and we believe even seals to us, the new covenant promise that we are united to Christ by faith. Baptism in itself does not unite us to Christ, but it is a visible sign of the union that you have with Christ by faith. And it's so closely associated together that Paul can speak of the one as though it is the other. And so baptism is important for God's people, and if you've not been baptized, then you should be baptized, and we'd be happy to do that because it is the visible picture of the fact that you have been united to Christ. You've been baptized into Him. He's now your identity. Look, he says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He's using the language of clothing. You've put on Christ like a new shirt, like a robe, like a garment. You've put him on. You're wearing him before the very presence of God. It's kind of a Halloween-y, Halloweenish kind of a, I don't know if Halloweeny or Halloweenish is the right word to ever use in a, but in that sort of sense, you have been dressed in Christ. John Calvin, one of the other great reformers, along with Martin Luther, he says that Christians are so closely united to Christ that in the presence of God, they bear the name and character of Christ and are viewed in Him rather than in themselves. Did you see? I think we have it on a slide. Christians are so closely united to Christ that in the presence of God, they bear the name and character of Christ and are viewed in Him rather than in themselves. That means when God looks upon you, what He sees is Christ. Bobby Knight, famous basketball coach. Many of you know that name from the Midwest or elsewhere. And uh, Bobby Knight coached many great basketball players during his tenure as a, as a head coach, among them people like Isaiah Thomas and even Michael Jordan at one level. But who was Bobby Knight's favorite player in all his years of coaching? Well, there's a picture of Bobby Knight hugging that favorite player and actually crying on his favorite player's shoulder. Most of you know that Bobby Knight was more known for throwing a chair at somebody than he was for hugging and crying on somebody's shoulder. But he had a favorite. Who was it? His favorite was Pat Knight. And you say, who in the world is Pat Knight? Isaiah Thomas I know, Michael Jordan I know, but who's Pat Knight? Pat Knight is Bobby Knight's son. Now, Bobby Knight coached Olympic gold medalists. He coached NBA national champions and MVPs. Pat Knight was not one of those. He was never a starter in his four years of playing for Bobby Knight. He would never go on and do something great in the NBA. He wasn't well-beloved because of his ball-handling ability or his scoring ability. That's, that's not why he was the coach's favorite. You know why he was the coach's favorite. He was the coach's son. And in a way that none of those other players could be, he was related to the coach in such a way that no matter what, he was his favorite. 
Now, the Scriptures tell us that Jesus Christ is God's beloved Son. He's the favorite. And those same Scriptures tell us that you are now dressed in Christ Jesus. You're one with Him so that when the Father looks upon you, He sees His favorite. In my family, I've seen my siblings passing around on Facebook some of those quizzes and so on, and they're trying to figure out who's the favorite in our family. <laughs> well, in God's family, we don't have to wonder who the favorite is. You're the favorite. You see, because you're in Christ. You're beloved. You're the favorite. Not because you're good. <laughs> not because you're better than anybody else. Not, not for any other reason except that you're His beloved Son. Amen? Number three, we are all heirs. We're all heirs. This is what he says in verses 28 and 29. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now, you might think that what Paul was, would say here is, if you are Abraham's, then you are Christ's. Because that's essentially what the Jews were saying. If you are Abraham's, therefore be circumcised, observe the works of the law, become Jewish, then you'll be Christ's. But Paul flips that on its head, and he says, no, no, no. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's. Meaning our relationship to Abraham is not based on a physical descendant. It's based on faith in Christ through whom we become children of Abraham and heirs of the promise by faith. He's saying something radical here. This is why the Jews largely hated the Apostle Paul. Because he's saying, you Gentiles who have put your faith in Christ, you are, as, you are more sons of Abraham than the Jews who do not believe. That's your position. You are an heir with Christ. Now, he goes on and he says in verse 25, he says, for uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. This is radical what Paul is saying here. You're all united in Christ. You're all dressed in Christ. You're all one. And so the former distinctions that, that used to make such a difference now, they don't mean so much anymore. Now, Paul is mis misunderstood here on this point, and so let me tell you what he's not saying and then tell you what he is saying. Paul is not saying that once you're a Christian that you cease to be Jewish or you cease to be Greek or you cease to be American or you cease to be white or black or any other thing. He's not saying you cease. We know from the book of Romans that he goes on and he, and he rejoices in his heritage as a Jew. He's also not saying that your class distinctions suddenly disappear and that they don't somehow become part of your life and inform the way you go through this world, slave or free and all the other distinctions that might be made. And he doesn't mean that now that you're in Christ, male and female are fluid gender distinctions in which you can move one way or the other depending on what's moving you. We know in other places he goes on to affirm the importance of male and female and the difference in creation and God's intention in them and so on. So many have used this, this particular text as a means for ordaining ladies to the office of elder and in so doing actually turn the Apostle Paul against himself when he actually is speaking directly to that very subject elsewhere. So what is he saying then? If he's not saying that those distinctions simply disappear, what's he saying? Here's what he's saying. He's saying that the most important thing about you now is not your racial heritage, it's not your ethnic heritage, it's not your class, it's not your education, it's not whether you're a male, it's not whether you're a female, whether you're rich or poor. The most important thing about you is that you're a child of God. That is the foundational marker of your identity. This is the marker that shapes all your other identities. This is the one that informs everything else about who you are. You are a child of God. Now, when you know that and you believe that deep in your core, then you can ask these questions that Tim Keller asks. He says, how can I look down on someone who is clothed with Christ? 
When I look around this church and I see you clothed with Christ, no matter how far you might have fallen, no matter how, how messed up and disheveled you might be today in your personal life, how can I look down on you when I know you are clothed in Christ's righteousness and I know how God sees you today? And likewise, why would I ever be jealous of anyone else when I am a son of God? What do I, what do I have to, to fear that is good, that's not going to come to me when I know who my Father is and what He's like? Do you see how having this profound sense of our in Christness creates a community that is radically united even when the people in it are radically diverse? You see, God's intention isn't to create a, a colorblind, androgynous society where there are no longer, where we're just all white, middle classish of a certain sort and education and background. That's not his intention at all. We know as we look at the book of Revelation that around the throne is a dazzling array of beautiful diversity gathered in worshiping the king. God's intention is to redeem our whole person. Do you know he's not just in the business of redeeming souls? He's redeeming bodies. He's redeeming your whole self, and that includes your background and where you come from and your ethnicity and your education and your attainments and your gender. He's making all of that whole as it should be. Sarah Shin, in an alumni magazine for Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, she brings this out in a way that really struck me. She says, we need to recognize what we are meant to be in our ethnic stories and identities so that we can ask Jesus to restore us. It's not just about being racially aware and sensitive. It's about Jesus redeeming and restoring our ethnic identities. Ethnic identity, or sorry, ethnicity no longer serves as the confines of mission. It becomes the vehicle the sacred vessel in which God's story comes to light. See, all these distinctions Paul was drawing, Jew, Greek, slave, free, and so on, these used to be the confines of our mission. We can't break out of these things. These define us. This is who we're with and who we live with. He says, but when Christ begins to redeem your ethnicity, he begins to redeem your maleness and your femaleness and, and your station in life, that actually becomes the vehicle through which you participate in his mission beyond those boundaries to people not like you. It's a redemption, grand. That's what he's doing. He's creating a people from every tongue, tribe, language, and nation. How can that be when we're so different and we have so many different backgrounds and so many different, we're so different, and it starts with this fundamental unity that we are in Christ, we're dressed in him, and he's redeeming our whole persons. So that's that. Number two, our sonship is God's gracious plan. Our sonship is God's gracious plan. It was his design and his intention. Look what we see here in two parts. First of all, our sonship, this idea of our, our, our guardianship, sorry, our guardianship was for a limited time. That was by God's design too, but it was for a limited time by design. Look what he says in verse, chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So again, hearkening back to last week, he's saying that for a time, God's people lived under captivity. They were under the law, under a guardian. That was God's intention. And he, and he, and he draws to mind the idea of an heir. So long as an heir is underage, they might be the owner of everything, but they don't have access to anything. They might as well. They're, they're essentially in the same lot as a slave. People tell them where to go, tell them what to do, and they have to listen. They call them young master as an acknowledgement of who you're going to be, but also this is who you are right now. And so he says in the same way, verse 3, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. That phrase is an odd one, but essentially in context we can see the elementary principles of the world is a synonym for the law. When we were children, we too were enslaved as we saw last week, in captivity to the law. That was for a period of time, we saw, to lead us to Christ, to expose our sin, to show us our need for a Savior. Well, that time has now been fulfilled, 
And so while our guardianship was for a limited time, the second thing we see is that our sonship is forever. Guardianship is for a limited time. Sonship is forever. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. When the time was right, God sent forth his only son who was truly God, And that only son was born of woman. He was truly man. And so this son of God, truly God and truly man, redeemed us from the law. How so? As our human representative, he bore the curse of the law that our sins deserved. But because he is also fully God, he could bear the infinite weight of God's wrath in a span of time upon the cross. The same wrath that will take us eternity to bear if we're not in Christ. And so this one who is fully God and fully man bears the weight of the curse in his own self for all who believe, and then he also throughout his life fulfilled the law's demands of righteousness so that we might be set free. Again, John Calvin puts it this way. He says, by putting on himself the chains, he takes them off the other. So Christ chose to become liable to keep the law. That exemption from it might be obtained for us. Christ took the chains on himself, and in so doing, he took them off of us, and he fulfilled the demands of the law so that we might have an exemption from it so that we can live out the obedience to the law, not by duty, but by choice. Not because we have to, but because we want to and we get to. That's what Christ has done for us. Our sonship was by design. Christ accomplished this for us, and it lasts forever. Now, you may not still think about God as being for you and having accomplished this on your behalf. You might still think, as I sometimes slip into thinking, that I still have to do something. I still have to wrestle this identity out of God's hand. He's got sonship here in his hand, and if I live up to it, he'll bestow it on me. And if I'm good enough today, I actually get to enjoy the blessings of being called his son. But I've got to get this. I've got to pry it from his hand that I'm his son. You ever think of him that way? Hannah Whitehall Smith, not all of whose work I can commend to you, but she's exactly right here, and this is what she writes. She says, where the, where the executors are honorable men, the heirs to an estate are not obliged to wrestle for their inheritance. The executors are appointed not to keep them out of it, but to help them into possession of it. I sometimes think Christians look upon our Lord as someone appointed to keep them out of their possessions instead of the one who has come to bring them in. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you see what Christ has done? It was God's plan for you to be his child. He's the one who's done it. His intention is to bring you in, to let you enjoy the fullness of what he's purchased and accomplished for you. It's it's the right way of seeing God our Father, not as one whom we're called to live up and meet some minimum standard of, of goodness before we get to be called as sons and daughters, but who actually came down and fulfilled it on our behalf so he could bestow it on you freely. How sad how we see God so often as a stingy old man who's not willing to give out anything until you give a pound of flesh. But don't you see that he gave the pound of flesh and more so that he could give it to you for nothing but faith? Number three, our sonship is the fundamental truth of our identity. It's the fundamental truth of our identity. Verse Six speaks about the fact that because we are sons, we have the spirit of the son. Look, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The spirit does not 
make you a son. You received the Spirit because through the work of Christ, you already are sons. Through the work of Christ, you already are sons. And so the same God who sent forth his Son to make you sons now sends forth the Spirit of his Son so that you begin to experience the reality of what is already objectively true. Through the work of Christ, you are sons of God, you who believe. And now he sends the Spirit into your heart so that you know from the inside out that God is my Abba Father so that you can speak to him with a term of intimacy like Daddy. He's given his Spirit, not just so that Intellectually, you can say, I'm a child of God, but so that you know at the very core of your being, I am a child of God. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan writer, puts it this way. He says, a man and his little child are walking down the road, and they're walking hand in hand, and the child knows that he's a child of his father, and he knows that his father loves him, and he rejoices in that, and he's happy in it. There's no uncertainty about it at all. But suddenly the father takes hold of the child and picks him up and kisses him and embraces him, showers his love upon him. And then he puts him down again. And they go on walking together. And that's it. The child knew before that his father loved him and he knew that he was his child. But oh, the loving embrace, this extra outpouring of love, this unusual manifestation of it, that is the kind of thing, the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, confirming what is already objectively true so that we experience the love and the hugs of the Father, which are, in fact, already ours by faith. Secondly, because we are sons, we can rest in our identity, because we are sons already, because of the finished work of Christ, we can rest in that identity. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to struggle for it. Listen to verse 7. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. That's who you are right now. You know, sometimes people will complain that Sometimes when we're singing a song like we, we did a moment ago that, you know, we sing the same thing over and over and over. We sing, I am a child of God. We must have said it 10 times. Can't, is it once enough? And the answer is no. You need to say that 10 times because you don't believe it. You don't, and I don't either. And so I have to say it to myself over and over and over. This is who I am because of what Christ has done. This is my identity. Nothing else but this. I am a child of God. And until that filters down through our thick skulls and into our hard hearts, even though it's objectively true, it doesn't change anything about the way we live moment by moment. And so the invitation is, know this is who you are. It's finished. It's done. If your trust is in Christ, you are a child of God. He's given you his Holy Spirit. Listen to the testimony of the Spirit that's crying out from your heart, telling you exactly who you are, and quit resisting it. Quit fighting it. Settle into it. Receive it and say, this is who I am right now. You see, if we're going to grow, though, in our awareness, in our experience of sonship, we have to grow in trust. How do we grow in trust? Brendan Manning, a great spiritual writer, he says this, in order to grow in trust, we must allow God to see us and love us precisely as we are. You see, because until we allow God to see us and love us as we are right now in this moment, we're going to keep running, we're going to keep pretending, we're going to keep performing, we're going to keep trying to fool God into thinking that we really are worthy of being your kids. I really am. I'm really, I'm not as bad. You know, I can cover up the bad stuff and I can put the good stuff out there in front of you and, and then you'll keep on loving me because I'm worthy of it. You see, and it, as so long as you think God is loving you because you're performing somehow, you'll never trust him. You'll never let him see your heart. You'll never love him. Why? Because you think if he knows what you're really like, there's no way he would accept you. There's no way he would love you. And some of you grew up in households that confirmed that very fear. 
He wants you to know he's not like that. He already knows everything. Quit pretending. Quit hiding. Step into the freedom of letting him love you as you are right now. Imagine with me a teenage girl. She's an otherwise good girl, wholesome, pure, good kid. But as she grew a little bit older and into her teenage years, she got mixed up with the wrong company. She started running with the wrong crowd. She got into drugs and alcohol and promiscuity and all the rest. And it wasn't long before her dabbling in drugs turned into a full-blown addiction to drugs. And as she got deeper into it, she began to push her mother away. She had to begin financing her addiction, and so she began to shoplift and steal. And her number one target of stealing, of course, was her single mother who was struggling to make ends meet. And all along the way, she's spinning down this, this spiral as she hides what she's up to, and she hides what she's really like, and her mother knows that something is going on. But the girl keeps hiding, and she keeps getting angry at her mother and pushing her mother farther away, her mother who only wants to be a part of her life and help her with what's going on. Well, at one point, the gig is up, and everything that she's been hiding comes out into the open. Her mother finds all of the drugs and all the paraphernalia. She finds all of the stolen goods. She finds out where all of her money's been going, and she realizes that her little girl is now a full-blown junkie, and the daughter is mortified. And as soon as she knows the gig is up, she takes off running away from her mother. And her mother goes after her, and she pursues her. And she grabs hold of her and hugs her. And the girl says, get away from me. And the mother is not reaching out in anger. She's reaching out to her in love. And the girl says, stop it. Leave me alone. And the mother grabs her by the cheeks and looks her in the eyes and says, I would give anything for you. I would die for you but I am not going to leave you alone right now. And the girl can't take it. She says, leave me alone. You don't want me. And the mother says, I do want you, and I will make this right. And the girl says, it can't be made right. And the mother stops arguing with her and simply holds her and hugs her, and the daughter keeps trying to push her away because she can't handle being loved like this, not with all of her stuff exposed. And they fall to the ground, and the mother begins to stroke her hair and tell her of her love for her daughter. And the girl is weeping, but finally she's slowing her resistance. And the mother sees something on the girl's arm, and she pulls back her sleeve. And the girl's deepest shame and secret is exposed. This poor girl has been cutting herself. And she's horrified. And she says, stop. And the mother won't stop. She pulls back the sleeve to reveal more. And the girl fearing what will happen next. The mother lifts her arm and without a word begins to kiss those wounds of self-destruction. And the girl is moved to tears because having the deepest part of her shame, her worst secret exposed, and, and knowing right now that my mother knows everything about me, and she's kissing my darkest secret with love. It begins to change her. And now she begins to weep with a sense of acceptance and love in her darkest place. She now is fully known, and for the first time, fully loved, and it changes her. And her mother then begins to pull down the sleeve, no longer covering up the shame and hiding it, but truly covering it up because it's been handled, it's been dealt with, it's finished, it's over. The scars remain, but the wounds have been healed by the power of love. This little girl knows what it means to stop pretending and stop performing and simply to rest in her position as a beloved child. And she would never be the same after that. Have you had that kind of encounter with your father in heaven? Where the gig is up, where you've stopped running, where you've stopped trying to perform for him, where you've stopped trying to pretend you're something that you're not, and you just decide, you know what? I'm just gonna drag it all out on the table. Father, this is what I'm really like. I know you know, but this is what I'm really like. This is what I really long for. This is what I've really desired. This is what I've really done. This is what I really think. This is who I really am. Here it all is. If you've not done that, I invite you to do that today. 
And I can assure you of this, that as surely as that mother reached down and kissed the wounds of her daughter, so your father will reach down and kiss you in the deepest, darkest parts of your shame and your sadness and your disappointment over who you are. And it will change you. Because for the first time, you will know what the Scripture is trying to get through to us, is that He loves you not because you're good, but because you're His. And nothing can change that. Brennan Manning, again, God is loving us, you and me, this moment, just as we are, not as we should be. There is nothing any of us can do to increase His love for us, and nothing we can do to diminish it. We are called to simply embrace it and to rest in it. So this morning, I invite you to do that. If you'd like to pray with somebody after the service, we'll have members of our prayer team up here. If you'd like to just be alone before the Father and you want to use these steps as a place to meet with Him and, and just to lay it all out and say, here I am, Father. No more censorship of what I'm really like. This is who I really am. I invite you to do that here. Or if later on this afternoon you want to do that in the quietness of your room or your house, until you've let him love you where you really are, you won't trust him. But knowing what he's done for us, what he accomplished through Christ's work, why he sent his spirit into us, gives us the confidence that we can be exactly who we are before him. And no, we won't be rejected, but actually be changed by his love in that moment. So enjoy your freedom as sons, brothers, and sisters. Rest in his words to you. You were mine, and though you ran away from me, I pursued you, I bought you, I paid for you, and now you're mine, all mine, and I will never let you go. Let's pray. Lord, I know I'm just like everyone out there this morning who intellectually agrees with these things, but experientially I'm, I'm far beneath the joy of being your child that you have done everything for me to experience. The only thing keeping me back from it is my own heart's resistance to being loved right where I am and just as I am. So Lord, would you break down the walls of our resistance? Would you pull away the shades. Would you expose us before your loving kindness this morning so that we might come away knowing that we are loved not because of anything we've done, but because you've bought us and we are yours and nothing can ever change that. For you are a good, good father. May we rest in it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.